Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore a chess game from literally beyond the grave. With me is Dr. Vernon Nepi, a neuropsychiatrist who is head of the Pacific Neuropsychiatric Institute in Seattle. He is the author of numerous books, including Cry the Beloved Mind. Reality begins with consciousness in a trilogy of books about deja vu. Welcome, Vernon. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. And in introducing you, I should say something about your credentials as a uh, chess player at the master level, a chess champion from South Africa, a person who organized uh, the first interracial chess tournament in South Africa. Uh, in fact, the first interracial athletic event, if one considers a chess tournament to be an athletic event. Yeah, chess match, which was organized between the Woodwatersrand University Chess Club. I was captain of the Woodwatersrand University chess team, and we were approached by a group of players who did not have a name for their club from Soweto. They were ultimately called the Soweto Chess Club, and this became the first multiracial sports game if chess is regarded as a sport in South Africa. And we mm -hmm. discovered at that stage, it was round about 1970, that it was legal provided we did not serve alcohol. Mm -hmm. But as a chess player, you're one of the rare individuals who could play, yeah, I think you told me, as many as 80 people at one time. Uh, that is true. I. Uh, had some challenges in terms of playing chess exhibitions mm -hmm. and it's rather exciting because people think oh well you've just got to uh, look at each board but of course there's a planning component yeah. and planning in chess is the key component. Mm -hmm. and, but beyond playing multiple people uh, at one time and looking at the chess board you could even play blindfolded. Yes I used to play blindfold chess but I have to admit I would choose my opponents very carefully because the quality of my chess would diminish down markedly. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in any case you're uh, a scholar and an individual who has an understanding of what it means to play chess at the master or grandmaster level. Yes, I try to understand that mm -hmm. and try to understand a piece of the history because what we're going to discuss relates to events pertaining to a player in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, Geza Maroxi was uh, the number two player in the world round about 1905. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is highly pertinent mm -hmm. in relation to his ostensible, or I, let us say the ostensible Geza Maroxi, uh, playing uh, Victor Kochnoy. And Kochnoy was, strange enough, the number two chess player in the world round about 1980, and in fact later on became the world's senior chess champion. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a game that took place between 1987 and 1993, initiated by a Swiss uh, scholar and uh, researcher who had the idea that evidence for survival after death could be enhanced if, if it were possible to uh, obtain the agreement of a, a, a deceased spirit to, who would be willing to manifest through a spiritual medium and play chess with a living grandmaster. Yeah, this is a remarkable story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, since Maroxi's death in the very early 1950s and suddenly uh, a communication ostensibly partly arising from the alleged, and I'll use that word alleged repetitively, and if I don't, mm -hmm. please understand that I'm meaning alleged. I'm not trying to uh, say this is definite or this is not definite, mm -hmm. but uh, from an alleged 
communicator beyond the grave who was a champion chess player and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Eisenbeis, uh, whose doctorate is in economics mm -hmm. in Switzerland, came up with the idea that maybe, just maybe, this would be the way to be able to prove survival after bodily death. Eisenbeiss himself was an amateur chess player. Yeah, I've gone through Eisenbeiss's games, or uh, one or two of them, and his level is that at a good, probably grade B player. Mm -hmm. He's not bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I went through one of his games is possibly the start of the story. Uh, it's not published. But it's very interesting because I often get people saying, well, you know, this is obviously fraud between the medium Rollins, or I've had Eisenbeiss being accused of fraud. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when one starts looking at the data, it will require a major conspiracy because there was even a Hungarian librarian involved and Eisenbeiss did not talk any uh, Hungarian and uh, a little bit of Meroxi's family who were rather ambivalent about all of this were also involved. But in any event, uh, Eisenbeiss, when he started uh, and first interacted with Robert Rowlands, the medium. We did automatic writing. Well, initially mm -hmm. what happened was he came up with something rather interesting. He discovered that Rowlands could not play any chess. Yes. And he had to at least teach him a little bit about the notation of chess so he could record this mm -hmm. during automatic writing. Mm -hmm. And Eisenbeiss said to him, well, you know, like, can you prove this is real? And Robert Rowlands's father, late father, the medium's late father, was an avid chess player. Oh. And Eisenbeiss, over a period of that day, played him a chess game, and that is also recorded. Mm -hmm. A very poor chess game with some interesting components of knights ending up in the corners of the board. Uh, I played through it, uh, one of my master friends played through it, uh, a grandmaster played through it. We all are of agreement that this was very much an amateur game. But in terms of standard, you could see he was a B-level player. Mm -hmm. And the reason, of course, is this allows him probably to have been able to uh, interact mm -hmm. and do this chess stuff, knows something about it, but he certainly wasn't at any kind of level where he could have produced mm -hmm. any of this. Because what we're talking about here in terms of evidence for survival has to do with a skill, the skill of playing chess at the master or grandmaster level. And that is not a skill that can be replicated by somebody, I presume, who hasn't studied chess extensively. That is true. And even if they had studied chess extensively, it would be very difficult for them to replicate that kind of level. Mm -hmm. So this case at times has been called the number one case in terms of proof of survival after bodily death. And there are several different sources that one could argue supporting that contention or the way they've described it. But the reason is it's not only the skills that are involved. It is a combination of skills and data. Mm -hmm. And there's an enormous amount of data that was generated. Let's talk about that data because, uh, as I understand it, Meroxi, uh, through automatic writing, was asked uh, a, a number of questions, detailed questions, about his life when he was alive as a chess player, obscure questions about various matches and things concerning his personal life. and. He was able to answer these questions through automatic writing with an incredible degree of accuracy. Exactly that. And they divided up these questions into general questions, the kinds of questions that one could find when looking it up in libraries or uh, from the records of chess tournaments, and very, very esoteric questions that only Maroxi would know. and that could be validated and this is where this Hungarian librarian came in who was not told this was 
a case of potential survival. He was just told that some kind of biography was being done on Geza Maroxi, and he went searching. And some of these esoteric questions required his family, but also there were answers to questions that appeared wrong and later on were shown to be right. So, for example, the famous one is the uh, Romi, yes. R-O-M-I-H, mm -hmm. I-H, and sometimes spelled slightly differently. Yes. And where Maroxi said, no, I didn't play that person. And they said, well, he did. And then it turned out that afterwards he pointed out that it was spelled differently. Mm -hmm. And another one related to Vera Menchik, who was uh, a famous woman's chess player at the time and a question of who was linked up with a particular chess club mm -hmm. and people didn't know the answer until afterwards so we're talking about not only esoterica but esoterica that at times were not even known and when one looked at incredible degree of accuracy it's very interesting because Eisenbeis and um, his co-author Dieter Hassler uh, initially published the data and they pointed out a couple of errors that uh, Maroxi had made. Mm. And when one started looking at it, the questions were not necessarily erroneous. So for example, uh, Maroxi had said, uh, spoken about the fact that he played somebody twice in a particular tournament and effectively he scored one point out of two. Now you can get that from two draws or from one win and one loss. Mm. And so ultimately uh, it was correct, but it was perceived as wrong, but it was wrong in the context of win-loss instead of mm -hmm. draws or vice versa. This kind of subtlety, mm -hmm. uh, another time who came third in the tournament? Well, you know, you play chess tournaments, you might have won it, but seldom would you know who came third. And he had said one world champion had come third when another of the world champions had come third, this kind of thing. And so there were really, really subtle areas of error, even in sort of the general historical mm. data. And when it came to the esoterica, there seemed to be absolutely nothing wrong with his answers, even though no one living alive at the time could have given all those answers. And they were specially composed. Eisenbeis composed them, and this was well, well researched. Now, I can imagine a critic would say that's proof it was fraud because you never get close to 100% accuracy in uh, survival research or parapsychology research? Well, of course, one could argue this both ways. Yeah. And when one looks at psi research amongst the living and one looks at tests in labs, you're getting nowhere near 100% accuracy. You might statistically get accuracy and score over a thousand hits uh, and be at the 52% level when you expect it to be statistically at the 50% level. Mm -hmm. The data in survival research is much, much higher in regard to this. And of course, somebody like Gary Schwartz has also found the same kind of figure. But the important thing is about the accuracy that some of these things appeared wrong and we knew them as wrong. So if they were fraudulent, one would have stayed with the wrong bits of information mm -hmm. because it was thought to be right. And later on has been found that uh, Maroxi's answers were correct and these were incorrect. So the important point here, and this to me is the key to this whole case, there are two keys. The one is data and skills amazing when you put them together. Mm -hmm. The second is the interesting one of extended survival. You see, it's not a case of, oh, well, they played this game quickly over a period of a few minutes and uh, maybe uh, Kochnoi was fabricating this all or maybe some other master was involved and quickly consulting with uh, Rollins uh, and the moves were delivered to Eisenbeis and they were delivered by automatic writing so there is a record of these and 
I want to write a play on this. And Wolfgang Eisenweis has been kind enough to send me all the transcripts he has available. So I've been able to see these in a written format as well. So the idea of survival here is not just a fragment moment of survival. Maybe this was a memory or something caught in space. This was over a period of maybe six years. And it was over a period of time when, uh, strangely enough, uh, a prediction was made that Rollins would be able to complete this, and he did, and then he died, mm. which was just uh, another esoteric piece of information. Yeah. And of course, his wife has been interviewed as well. And this was the most honest of individuals, apparently, who did a lot of mediumship, never accepted a penny for this, had no real uh, let us say, financial motivation to do this. And nor did Eisenbeis. Eisenbeis kept this very, very quiet for some years. Mm -hmm. It was, wasn't until 2006, I believe, or 2007, that he published uh, his analysis of all of the information that the ostensible spirit of Meroxi had provided. And yeah, he was encouraged to mm -hmm. do this. But it was years later. He had no intention of really achieving great publicity out of it. But strangely enough, there were some important components that came about because in the middle of the game, the press somehow got hold of it and they ran a story. And so it could be argued, well, if this was fraud, they were also keeping a great eye on this mm -hmm. all the way through the second half. Mm -hmm. And there was a Swiss champion, chess champion at the time, who also very early on had gone through this. And Kochnoy had later on commented, even before the end of the game, how well Maroxi was playing. He wasn't even sure if he was going to win the game. Mm -hmm. And so there were these different elements. But later on, there was another person who ostensibly examined it beyond me at a far, far higher level of chess. And we're talking now about the American chess grandmaster Bobby Fischer, who is the brother-in-law, it turns out, of parapsychologist Russell Targ. Yes, and it was apparently through Russell that this all came about. And Russell, probably at Bobby Fischer's request, and of course Bobby Fischer, some would argue, is the greatest world chess champion in the history of chess. Mm -hmm. He might have been the greatest player in the history of chess, but of course became extremely psychotic, yeah. as is well known, and there have been movies made about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, possibly as a consequence of Russell, I understand that Bobby Fischer also went through this game. Move by move. I haven't got the detail he went yeah. through because, you know, when you're playing at that level of chess, mm -hmm. you can virtually eyeball the whole chess game <laughs> and know what is going on. And, yes. But his mm -hmm. comment was anyone who could give that kind of level of fight to uh, Bobby Fischer over that number of moves. You mean Korknoy? To Korknoy, yes, mm -hmm. uh, was somebody who is probably playing at grandmaster level. This was not my evaluation right. though. But you did also your own evaluation move by move of the match. Yes, but the most important component was I read this report and I thought this is very interesting. And I published this in the Journal of the Society of Psychical Research, uh, making comments about my strengths and weaknesses historically as a chess player. You don't consider yourself a grandmaster. No, and I gave up chess many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. However, I said to myself, this is something that needs to be sought after. Yeah. And we had a control, and that was Computers. Mm -hmm. Now, computers in the late 1970s, early 1980s are not like chess computers today. Chess computers today, I'm afraid this is one of the last bastions of humanity beating up robots mm. and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and it's failed. Mm. It's failed because chess computers now 
can beat even world champions. Mm -hmm. But in those days, that was not so. And I took a chess computer program that I had, and I would actually regularly play. I regularly play this program, but probably plays at the low master level. Mm -hmm. I win in maybe 98% of cases. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of level it's playing. It's certainly very beatable. Yeah. But this was the level of chess computers of the day. And the question came up, maybe, just maybe, all this is fraud. The chess computers could possibly have faked this all, or somebody could have faked it through the chess computers. And what we found was that, first of all, the style of Maroxi, and when you're at that level, you know, world championship level, even in 1905, you have particular kinds of styles. Based and on the cultural historical era. And also based on the individual player. Okay. Every player plays differently. You can mm -hmm. recognize the games almost of a Bobby Fischer, somewhat. Mm -hmm. You can recognize the games of an Alexander Alekine. You can recognize the games of Akiba Rubinstein. Mm -hmm. You can recognize the games of Nimsovich in the same way you could recognize the games of Maroxi. Mm -hmm. And so this stylistically was so. And so I set this computer such that what would he respond or what would she respond or it respond, uh, give it a personality, maybe in today's PC world we'll yeah. say she. Okay. <laughs> but what would the computer respond? And we were able to see that this was pretty much impossible for the computer to have replicated this game. Mm -hmm. And I played the game as well mm -hmm. and uh, could see it in the same kind of fabric. We were dealing almost with somebody who was expressing a personality structure because, you know, when you play chess weekly, you're not expressing that structure. When you play chess at that kind of level, you are. There's a style that you have. Mm -hmm. And this was the style of Maroxi, just like there was a style of Fisher. So in addition to skill and information, you're saying the personality of Maroxi came through in this example. And it came through also in some of these questions, the Romy question, the Vera Menchik question. Mm -hmm. And I used the example of Fisher. And there is a funny story which might illustrate mm -hmm. the link up a little more. Yes. I had the good fortune to lecture in South Africa on the Fischer Spassky chess series. Mm. And in one of the games, one of my listeners who would listen avidly, the games would come through, the move would come through on radio at the time, and I would say, Fischer's next move will be X. Sure enough, Fisher's next move would be X. And somebody came up to me excitedly and said, you know, uh, uh, who knows, it was 37 moves or something of this sort, the game. And he said, you got the same move as Bobby Fisher 35 of the 37 times. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's why I'm not Bobby Fisher, because chess is an absolute unit. And when one looked at this Maroxi game, he was losing it by playing an inferior move very early on in the opening. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't really his fault, because that was the move that would have been played in 1905. And when he came back and was playing more chess in the 1930s, for example, the alternative refutation was unknown when he passed, as far as I remember, it was in 1951. Mm. So his move was what was known then, and it was a good move, but it was not the appropriate move for 
the 1970s and, and 1980s. And the ostensible spirit of Baroxy said he, he was rusty. This is a game in the 1980s. He made the in, comment in, that he was rusty. and He hadn't we, kept up his chess skills. When we did an analysis, we said, okay, maybe he was playing at the high master level. Uh, some would say the grand master level. I mean, Fisher said, mm -hmm. well, this is like a grand master. Yes. I think it was at the high master level or even at the low master mm -hmm. level. You've got to understand that chess theory has so developed that in order to keep up with chess, you have to keep up with the theory, and it takes a long, long time. Mm -hmm. You can, people are full time professional chess players, they spend six, eight hours a day training in their chess, studying opening chess theory, studying things. Mm -hmm. And when you prepare for a world championship, like Magnus Carlsen, the current world chess champion, he was lifting weights. He was playing a lot of table tennis. He was getting as fit as anything because it is so stressful and so difficult in terms of physical components. So there's the physical aspect that would go on and there's the absolute preparation such that I, lowly I, at this stage or when I was playing chess regularly and was keeping up with it, it is possible that I could have beaten the Maroxi of 1905. Mm -hmm. Not because he wasn't much, much better than me, but because chess theory is such that he might have failed because of ideas that change. Now, once you have a minimal advantage in chess, if you're a really good chess player, you can carry through that minimal advantage and you win as mm -hmm. a consequence of it. Even if you're playing against a world chess champion sometimes, they might be able to get a draw, but they might not mm -hmm. be able to. But of course, they don't give up those minimal advantages. They are too good for that. And of course, in this particular match, Korchnoi did win. Yes, Korchnoi did win. And so this put paid to the idea that, well, you know, uh, if this was going to be fabricated, wouldn't have it been nice if Maroxi won? And, you know, it's fascinating when you start looking at how the media talks about it. In fact, mm -hmm. in one of the Bobby Fischer movies, they talked about people who were mad in chess and they pointed to Fischer and they pointed to Steinitz and Wolfgang Steinitz, as far as I remember, uh, way back in the 19th century, announced that he wanted to play God because he said he would beat God. <laughs> in chess. And uh, so you go backwards in time and who was quoted? Poor Korchnoi. But they didn't say he played it. He said there was this chess champion grand master, one of the leading players in the world, who claimed he played a ghost. And this is ridiculous. And they made a joke about it. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at it, extended survival over a period of time is quite something. And because of it, you've got to look at all the alternative explanations. Vernon Neppe, our time is up, but this has been a fascinating discussion of what is probably, while not 100% conclusive, one of the strongest cases we have for evidence of survival after death. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank me. you, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us.